need to record this. So um, it is a great honor for us to have Professor Jody Callam in our seminar. Professor Callam has a BSc with uh, first class honors in psychology from the University of Calgary, where she already started to do research on contrast flicker thresholds and age in Don Klein's Vision and Aging Lab and Jane Raymond's Visual Perception Lab. Um, during which she received multiple awards. She then continued to do a PhD at Harvard in Cognition, Brain and Behavior under the supervision of Patrick Kavanaugh, collaborating with Nancy Kanwisher, where she started doing neuroimaging, fMRI combined with psychophysics on attention, motion and moving objects. She then moved to Western University to do a postdoc with Mel Goodale, where she started to investigate the vision for action system. She then became faculty at Western University and was also a visiting professor in multiple distinguished academic institutions across the world. She uses multiple techniques as neuroimaging, psychophysics, kinematics, VR, neuropsychology to investigate visual processes, visual system, vision for perception and vision for action, attempting to bring scientific paradigms closer to real world settings. Her research is funded by many prestigious research grants. She collaborates with multiple researchers across the world. Throughout her studies and her career, she has won multiple awards at all stages of her career for her research, for her teaching and uh, lecturing skills. She teaches on campus as well as online courses with more than thousands of attendees a year. She supervises dozens and actually supervises dozens of graduate and postdocs, most of which have continued to a successful scientific career in top universities and institutes. She's on the board of directors of the Vision Sciences Society and has been on multiple VSS committees. She's been on numerous grant committees, a reviewer in a multiplicity of uh, scientific journals, grants on journal editorial boards of multiple journals, organizers of different conferences and meetings, university, she, she's um, uh, taken upon herself uh, university administrative roles, and this is just a very partial list. She's highly involved in youth outreach and community service. She has an age index of over 50, more than 10,000 citations published in top leading journals as Neuron Trends in Cognitive Neuroscience, Current Opinion in Neurobiology, Journal of Neuroscience, eLife, Current Biology, and many others. There's so much more to say, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Professor Jody Calham, to our seminar to tell us more about your research, and thanks, you for, um, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sharon, for the lovely introduction, and thank you for organizing this uh, series of talks. Um, it's a, a really impressive line of speakers, and, and I've been really happy. I've been recommending that my lab members uh, watch some of these to get up to speed in vision, especially now that we're in a pandemic. and don't get to go to conferences as much. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna tell you today about a new term um, that, that I've started to use, which is immersive neuroscience. And by that term, um, what I mean is neuroscience research and applications that are focused under real world situations and also compelling simulations, which might include things like uh, virtual reality and video games. Um, and the, the idea with immersive neuroscience is to reconsider as a field how we can incorporate more realistic tasks, including action tasks, more realistic stimuli, and more realistic um, situations in which cognitive processes unfold more as they would in the natural environment. Um, and this um, idea goes back actually quite a long way, um, or, or my, my foray into thinking about some of these things goes back um, actually about 25 years uh, to when I started doing a postdoc with Mel Goodale, and we were interested in starting to use this then new technique of functional MRI to study actions. And at the time, the sorts of action tasks that were being studied were things like action observation, watching movies of people doing things, action imagery, thinking about what it would be like to do an action, or pantomimed actions, pretending that you were doing something like pounding a nail. Um, but even back then, I sort of had this insight that, that, that um, if we really wanted to understand the action system, we should move more to studying genuine actions um, that have consequences. And so we embarked on this endeavor back then of trying to figure out how we could get real actions into this crazy constrained space of an MRI scanner. Uh, and so this was the um, 
the original approach we took here with um, uh, putting people in the scanner with their heads tilted so they could look outside the head coil and putting equipment like um, uh, our, what we called then the grasparatus, the grasping apparatus in the workspace of the hand. Um, here's a more modern version of the same setup, but basically the same idea. So we tried as much as the constraints of MRI would allow, we tried to get things somewhat more natural by at least having direct viewing without mirrors and by having people actually interact with objects. And we studied different things like uh, grasping and tool use, and we discovered and characterized some human brain areas like uh, the anterior intraparietal sulcus, which is involved in grasping, and the superior parieto occipital or cortex, um, which is involved in arm transport. And along the way, we did some experiments to see if it really mattered. Was all of this bother of trying to get real actions in the scanner worth it? And in the several studies we've done, it does seem like it makes a difference. So we found that real actions matter in that you get stronger activation and qualitatively different activation if you're doing genuine grasping than if you're pretending to do a grasp. Um, and we found a similar thing with, with tool use. Um, uh, and we've also found uh, through uh, my former postdoc, Arez Freud, we found that the realness of the objects that you're acting upon matters as well, that you get different uh, neural representations if you're performing a grasp on a real object versus a two-dimensional image. And that was kind of what got me started thinking about some of these issues of realness in cognitive neuroscience and, and thinking about, well, why would it be different to do a real action than to do a pantomimed action when the low level attributes are very similar? Um, and on reflecting on this, I think some of the key differences are that real actions have real consequences. And there's a lot of um, literature in, in um, uh, motor neuroscience talking about this idea of closed loop um, motor function where you might perceive something, say an object to be grasped, you might have some cognitive processes like uh, recognizing it or thinking about what your goals are for that object, and you might execute the action. Uh, but the key idea of closed loop is that that action has consequences in the environment and those consequences feed back to the sensory system um, to close the loop, as you will. And um, there's a lot of thought in motor neuroscience about the importance of closed loop in that the sensory feedback allows you to correct mistakes on the fly. And perhaps even more importantly, the sensory feedback allows you to change your model of the world so that the next time you try to do something, you'll be more accurate. And even though this has been an idea that's been very dominant in the motor system, I think it applies to all of cognition and that a lot of what we do in cognitive neuroscience focuses on experiments that try to isolate some of these components to isolate perception or cognition or action or to have tasks like pantomime grasping where uh, the loop isn't fully closed because there's not genuine consequences. So having um, gone through some of the, the uh, effort to find ways to put real objects in the scanner, we then began to wonder, well, you know, can we use this to even um, look at, at processes like um, object recognition? And, and so um, uh, those of you who've seen my, me talk before will have um, uh, seen this, this image from Rene Magritte um, that, uh, that you probably know about where the line at the bottom says, ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe, um, where Magritte is getting at this notion that even though this image looks very much like a pipe, it is not a pipe because it doesn't afford the actions of a pipe, that you can't stuff it and smoke it and so on, that it's just a representation. Um, and so thinking about this, um, uh, uh, Jacqueline Snow um, and I just wrote uh, a review paper in TICS where we summarize some of the reasons we think that the realness of objects might matter for the responses that are evoked in the brain. And there's a whole bunch of reasons listed here, but the two that I'm gonna emphasize um, in the next section of my talk are that uh, pictures do not afford action such as manipulation, and that might be particularly important for the dorsal visual stream. And I'm also gonna talk quite a bit in this uh, talk today about how there's certain aspects of real object, namely having a physical size and a physical distance um, that, um, uh, carry attributes that might be more important than we've recognized because we've relied so heavily on using images to understand the visual system.
Um, so Jackie and I have characterized um, uh, some of the things that have been reported in the literature that have been called the real object advantage, um, which indicates that across a whole series of different paradigms, um, there are differences between two dimensional images and real objects by which I mean physical, tangible, solid objects. Um, so we find, for example, that in both infants and adults, um, real objects capture gaze and presumably then attention better than images do. Uh, Jackie's shown that people are better at remembering an array of real objects than uh, the same array depicted in a photo. Um, intriguingly, Jackie has some really nice results, Jackie's lab, that um, show using EEG that the real objects evoke stronger motor processing. So if you see a real object, you get a, a motor signature, and that signature is dampened down if you do something like put a plexiglass barrier um, between the participant and the object to um, uh, reduce its accessibility. Uh, there's been research in neuroeconomics showing that real objects um, evoke higher valuations. And there's research from uh, clinical neuropsychology showing that patients with visual agnosia uh, recognize objects better when they see them in physical form. Um, and then finally, Jackie and I showed using an fMRI adaptation study that real objects seem to be processed more deeply in that they don't show the same degree of fMRI adaptation as images do. Um, so just to give you a flavor of some of this, here's um, some work um, uh, that, that shows not only that, that some of these differences are quantitative, that they're difference in magnitude, but also that the nature of the representations that we get with real objects may be different from those that we see with pictures. Uh, and so this was work that was led with by Jackie Snow back when she was my postdoc. And we built this uh, crazy piece of equipment uh, that was called the DROID, the Delivery of Real Objects for Imaging Device, which uh, if the movie works here. Yes. Oh, hang on. Uh, this worked when we tried it earlier. Um, yeah. PowerPoint's in a weird mode. So I don't think you don't, you don't actually need to see it uh, animated. I can just explain what's going on here. So you can see, um, uh, here's an experimenter here getting cues from a headphone. Uh, you can see the droid, which is a long conveyor belt here. And on the conveyor belt, you get um, these semicircular plates here. Uh, and the reason they're semicircular is that because as they get to the end, as the experimenter pushes the handle, the plates rotate around and they fit right in the top of the bore of the scanner. And we can put different objects on the plates, uh, which can be real objects, like these are real socks here, or we can put um, photographs of those same objects that are matched for size and viewpoint and uh, the low level properties as, as closely as we can get. So here, for example, are some pictures of hammers. So we've got in a given experiment, you might see real socks and photos of socks and real hammers and photos of hammers. And with this device, the droid, we can present this series of objects rapidly in a rapid event related design so that we can get um, uh, robust responses uh, and then compare them across the real objects and the images. And so this was uh, the design more broadly. So we had six different categories of objects. We had four exemplars within each category. And then again, um, each object could be presented either in its real tangible physical format or as a matched photograph. And we used multivoxel pattern analysis. I assume most of the people here are familiar with it, but just in case we've got students that might not uh, be completely up to speed on some of this stuff. The, the gist of uh, multivoxel pattern analysis is that we can look at the patterns of brain activation uh, within a brain area and we can compare them across conditions. And so um, in such a case, we might expect to find that um, if we have the same situation, if we've got, uh, say, for example, images of hammers in even runs and odd runs, those might evoke a similar response in those two uh, split halves, uh, the same thing with socks. Socks might be like socks, but if you look at this cartoon, you'll see that the hammers are more like, like hammers in a different run than they are like socks. And so we can take the, these measures of similarity, even just using something as simple as a correlation, and we can make a matrix that shows you here that hammers are like hammers and socks are like socks, but hammers and socks are not like one another. And we can do this for the whole uh, battery of stimuli here.
And then another thing we can do, of course, we do all the statistical analyses on this, but I'll just show you the qualitative results here, which are borne out by the statistics. Um, we can take this data and we can visualize it by performing multidimensional scaling on it. So with multidimensional scaling, we can put objects in a representational space where the distances between the stimuli is um, indicative of how similar they are to each other in the neural patterns that they evoke. Mm -hmm. And so if we do this um, for this battery of stimuli, if we do this in early visual cortex in the medial occipital lobe, you can see not too surprisingly that objects are like themselves. So a toothbrush is like a toothbrush, regardless of whether it was rendered as a real object or a two dimensional photograph. Sunglasses are like sunglasses, socks are like socks. Um, so, so we see this clearly in the earliest stages of visual processing. But where it gets interesting is when we move into higher level processing and when we move into the dorsal visual stream. So we can look, for example, in my favorite visual or my favorite area, which is the anterior intraparietal sulcus, uh, an area we've been studying for quite a while for its role in visually guided reaching. Um, and we can identify AIPS in the usual way that it's defined, which is by showing a higher response when participants are grasping an object and they have to process something about its, its 3D form versus when they're reaching it and they only need to really process information about its location. So we can, um, what we did for this was we did a meta-analysis of a whole bunch of different grasping and reaching versus reaching studies and we found um, the location of that and then we extracted the patterns of brain activation from this region and looked at the um, responses to our different um, uh, stimuli here. And what you can see is that it looks very different in AIPS than it did in the medial occipital lobe. Here we don't see, for example, that a hammer is like a hammer. We see that all of the real objects grouped together and all of the photographic objects grouped um, group together. So for example, um, a physical hammer is more like a physical candle than it is like a picture of a, of a hammer, um, indicating that uh, certainly in these areas that are concerned with things like um, grasping and graspability, um, uh, uh, what really matters is the realness. I just got a little message that my internet is unstable. Hopefully it's, it's okay on your end. Uh, yeah, it's okay at the moment. Maybe there was a little glitch, but but yeah, yeah it's okay. <laughs> okay, it usually doesn't last long. So if I go away, I should come back soon. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So um, we can take a look throughout the visual system at some of these responses. And what this diagram is showing is, um, I only showed you two areas here. I showed you the medial occipital cortex and I showed you AIP and you saw that there was a difference in how much they responded to, um, uh, in the case of early visual cortex, it was what seemed to really matter was the identity of the object more than the realness, which is indicated here by the green colors. And in AIP, we saw that identity and realness both mattered. Um, and if anything, um, uh, realness might have, have been more influential. And so we've color coded different brain areas here with this spectrum. And you can see that in the early visual areas um, and in the, the ventral stream and in MT, um, there's more graded responses where realness matters a little bit, but not that much. But as we begin to go up the hierarchy into the dorsal stream, we see that realness matters more and more. And, and that's particularly true in uh, AIP, this grasp selective area. So this data suggests um, this was, you know, a lot of our findings with the differences between real objects and images have been quality or sorry, quantitative. In other words, you get more responses like the real object advantage, you get more of a response with the real object. But this study actually suggests that, um, that it may not just be a difference in magnitude, it may be a difference in um, the type of representations and that that might be particularly important for the dorsal stream, uh, given its role in using vision for um, action. Um, okay, so um, for the remainder of the, the main part of my talk here, uh, I wanna focus on one particular attribute that seems to be particularly important that may be uh, neglected by our heavy reliance on 
um, images, which is, I should have actually put size and distance here. So we've embarked on this whole line of research to look at um, behavioral and brain responses to objects when we vary the, um, the size and the distance, um, and to begin to do that even with real objects in fMRI to look at the neural responses to physical size and distance changes. And this is uh, something of a departure from the way things are usually done in, in vision science in fMRI and that a lot of studies, and there's been many uh, wonderful studies that have characterized category selective responses in uh, extra striate visual areas in response to different stimuli like these. And the, the standard way of doing it is that you uh, present participants with a series of images and you match those images for retinal size. So all of these images might have a comparable retinal size, even though in the real world, the physical size of these objects can differ by uh, many orders of magnitude that, for example, the Eiffel Tower is going to be, you know, I think it's something like an eightfold difference in order of magnitude compared to something like an apple. Um, and yet these are all presented on a computer screen at a constant distance with a constant retinal angle. Um, <laughs> now, sorry, was there a question? All right, I just heard something. Um, so uh, we know from some of the past literature that different brain regions code different aspects of size and distance. Of course, early visual cortex is organized around retinal size and eccentricity. Um, although even there, we know that um, from, from experiments like uh, Scott Murray and Irena Sperandio, we know that um, the, the perceived size can make a difference um, even as early as V1. Um, we know from uh, the elegant work of Helia Conkle and Ode Oliva that the ventral stream organization can be accounted for in large part by uh, size organization where things that are processed that are small and are processed in the fovea are represented in different patches of tissue than objects that are um, large in the real world. And we know from some of the work on the dorsal stream that uh, areas like AIP seem to be concerned with the physical size of the objects for tasks like grasping and regions like um, this area that I mentioned briefly before, Spock, which is involved in arm transport, um, that in that case, it seems to be concerned with attributes um, related to distance. Um, and, and it seems like um, vergence seems to be a particularly important cue in that brain region for uh, driving um, the distance responses. So we've got this plethora of different studies that have looked at different aspects of size and distance, but what we wanted to begin to do was to start to look at all of these areas together using the same paradigm and using real objects. Um, but we began first, um, as, as I always like to do, we began just by starting to characterize the behavior. So to develop some behavioral experiments, which we could um, use to, um, to characterize people's responses. And then the other powerful thing about the behavior is that we can also use the behaviors then as models for the neuroimaging data, especially if we're gonna move into multivoxel pattern analysis and different models. So these behavioral experiments were done, um, it was a series of experiments that I'll tell you about. And these were um, begun by my PhD student, Margaret Maltz, um, with Anna Zebka and Kieran Hussey as a couple of honor students. Um, Kirsten Babin, a programmer, and uh, our collaborator, Lori Wilcox. Um, so the first study that we did here was one that was led by Margaret Maltz. Um, this is, just came out in, in Journal of Vision a couple of weeks ago. And we just wanted to look at um, size and distance perception for real objects, um, uh, real tangible objects. And so we built this long tunnel and we presented these objects in the tunnel in isolation. And the objects could be either a Rubik's cube or a die, and they could be presented either at the natural physical size, the familiar size of the Rubik's cube, or the familiar size of the die. Or alternatively, um, we made alternate versions where we made a Rubik's cube the size of a die, and a die the size of the Rubik's cube. And we chose the sizes such that when we put these at either a near distance or a far distance, the small near objects subtended the same retinal angles as the large far objects. And, and you'll see later, we applied this in an fMRI study as well, um, where we wanted to keep the visual angle similar. So we can have uh, the two objects at the two sizes at two different distances. 
And I'm going to focus for the purposes of the talk here on just these conditions here where we've matched visual angle. And then we had a very simple task. We simply asked our participants to estimate the size of the objects and the distance of the objects using their hands. For the size, they just opened their index finger and thumb to indicate how large they perceived the object. And for the uh, distance, they opened the distance between their two index fingers um, to indicate um, how far away they thought it was. And we recorded those measurements with a, a motion capture system. Uh, we also did this under two conditions. So in one condition, the participants were in a chin rest and they had full binocular vision. Um, and in another case, they looked through a monocular pinhole so that they had uh, no cues to vergence or to accommodation. Um, so we had uh, different hypotheses here, um, and we were particularly interested in what we're calling the, the familiar size effect. So we know that um, uh, one of the things that can provide a very powerful cue to depth is familiar size in that you know that a die is typically about this big and a Rubik's cube is typically about that big. And so uh, you could be using um, one of two different cues. You could either perceive things veridically that a small die is small and a large die is large. And that's what's depicted here. So here you just see the objects. Um, this is perceived size on this axis, perceived distance on this axis. This line indicates a line of constant visual angle. And this would be a situation in which people perceive things veridically based on their true size and distance, small is small and large is large. Um, and there's um, uh, little or no familiar size effect. So there's no difference by a familiar size effect. I mean, the difference between the perceived size and distance of the die versus the Rubik's cube. Or in the other extreme, um, you could imagine if people are relying entirely on familiar size, uh, their judgments would just depend on the object identity rather than the physical attributes of the object, and then we'd have a very large familiar size effect. Um, so we did this here. This is the actual data, um, and you can see that in this situation with binocular viewing, they're actually doing reasonably well. There's some distortions. They're not exactly perceiving them uh, veridically, but they're certainly perceiving that the small objects are more like one another and the large objects are more like one another than, um, than between sizes. So there's not very much of a familiar size effect here. But when we go to the monocular pinhole condition, you can see that there's um, a much bigger effect of familiar size here um, in that uh, the perception is driven um, to a greater degree by the identity of the object, whether it's a die or a Rubik's cube, than by its physical properties. So that was the first th thing that we did, and, and um, uh, this uh, resolved some of the, or, or addressed some of the longstanding differences in the literature, um, where, where some of the results, even like this with real objects, had been mixed in the past literature, depending on, on um, the properties of the experiment. Um, but really, this served for us as a foundation for moving to an fMRI study, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But before I get to the fMRI study, I also want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of what we've been doing to look at virtual reality and to see, we're, you know, we're, we're, we'd love it if virtual reality would be um, an accurate proxy for reality, because it's a whole lot easier to generate real stimuli and, and real environments than it is to do things like manufacture Rubik's cubes at different sizes. Um, so we wanted to test some of that. And so we had an honor student, Anna Zhebka, who um, uh, did a version of the same experiment, but in virtual reality. So she generated uh, virtual versions of the Rubik's cube and the die. She um, kept everything else the same. And we presented the stimuli in an Oculus Rift headset and had people do exactly the same task of the manual size and distance estimation. So just to remind you, these were the results on the top row here. These were the results when we looked at um, tangible objects, real objects. Now let's look at the results that we got from virtual reality. So when we did um, virtual reality with the monocular pinhole condition, the results looked very similar to reality in that we found a very um, strong familiar size effect that seemed to overwhelm the um, vertical perception based on size and distance. Where things got interesting, however, was when we looked at what happened in virtual reality under uh, binocular viewing conditions. 
And here you'll notice that VR yields uh, quite a different response than physical objects do. Namely, with the, the, the real objects here, we saw that people were reasonably good at um, uh, picking up on the um, cues to the physical size and distance, and they didn't rely much on familiar size. And yet in virtual reality, you can see that the results look very different. And here we see a very large familiar size effect that's more comparable to what you see in um, the monocular pinhole conditions for the other situations than they are to the binocular vision conditions. So even though the participants um, uh, do have binocular vision and they certainly got uh, vergence cues here, they're not trusting that uh, binocular information to the same degree as they were in the real world. Uh, we did a follow-up experiment just um, to make sure that um, one, one of the crit criticisms of the, the studies I've shown you so far is, well, maybe there's something about the Rubik's cube and the die that um, uh, is, is a low-level stimulus property that, that's leading to confounds in the results. So we wanted to try doing a similar experiment, but with a more diverse range of objects. And so we replicated the study using sports balls. So we took sports balls that are typically small in the real world, a golf ball, a billiard ball, and a baseball. Uh, and we took um, objects that are typically larger in the real world, a volleyball, a soccer ball, and a basketball. And we rendered them either in large or small sizes. And um, again, we uh, did an experiment where we kept the, the visual angle the same. So we extended this to a different range of objects and we moved to a better headset. So rather than the Oculus, um, we've started using a, a Vario um, virtual reality system, which, which has um, a lot of nice features compared to the Oculus. It's got much higher resolution because it has foveated rendering and it allows us to better optimize the interpupillary distance for our participants. So we made all of these changes. We changed the objects, we changed the headset but the results didn't change. So we found even in this situation that we got um, very large familiar size effects. Uh, the identity of the objects um, uh, didn't really matter. What, what uh, seemed to make an effect was just the familiar size that you always perceive the small, the objects that are small in the real world as being smaller than the objects that are large in the real world. So this was, was um, an indication of an approach that I'll tell you a little bit about later about why we think it's important to, even though we're really excited about the possibility of working with virtual reality, why it might be important to validate it um, against reality and see what things may be a little bit different. And here, um, we think that the, the key limitation that we have here with virtual reality is the, the virgence accommodation conflict. So even though the participants converge at the correct distance in um, virtual reality, the display, plane, the display pane remains at a constant distance. So accommodation is always in conflict with uh, vergence. And what may be happening here is that when you have that conflict, you just learn to trust the binocular cues less and you rely more on the monocular cues like familiar size. Uh, this also suggests that um, for applications like VR, uh, where it might be important for people to perceive uh, size veridically, say things like image guided surgery, there might be some strategies that could be used to take advantage of um, relative size cues um, and maybe other cues like um, proprioception. Okay, so that's the behavioral data. We've seen um, that, uh, that there's, um, that, that people can, uh, with binocular cues, they can perceive size and distance reasonably accurately. Um, and so now what I wanna do is look at what happens uh, to brain activation when we move into fMRI. Um, whoops. So uh, this was a uh, part of uh, Margaret Maltz. Sorry, she changed her name and I forgot to update my slides. Uh, she now goes by Margaret Maltz, uh, my PhD student. Um, and this was an fMRI experiment that she did as the first project in her PhD. So this is exactly the same experiment we did behaviorally, but now participants are lying in a scanner and they're looking at the Rubik's cubes and the dice, um, again, with the same situation where they can either be um, a Rubik's cube or a die, they can be large or small, and they can be at one of two distances and a subset of those distances has been matched for visual angle. <clears throat> 
And then we also did something here. We introduced a virtual fixation point. So the participant was always uh, verging at the vertex of the object. They always had, um, even when th there was a, a pair of goggles here that they were looking through and the goggles would be closed when we were changing up the objects. But even when the goggles were closed, um, reflected in the goggles was a fixation point that could either be at a far location that corresponded to um, the vertex of the far object or at a near location that corresponded to the, the vertex of the near object. So from the subject's point of view, they would either see um, a fixation point here or a fixation point there. And then at some point the goggles would open and they would see um, the object presented for, I forget what it was, probably a second or something. Uh, and we began by looking uh, just at activation levels um, using a univariate analysis. And I'm not going to show you the, the raw data because there's quite a bit of it and there's a lot of visual areas that are involved. But basically, when we looked at activation levels, we saw what we would expect from the literature. So we saw, for example, that in early visual cortex, uh, what mattered the most was the retinal size. Um, in this reach selective area, Spock, we saw that distance mattered as it did in AIP. In the ventral stream, in the lateral occipital cortex, what seemed to really matter was the perceived retinal size. Uh, so we got a bigger response to the Rubik's cube than the dye. And we also discovered here an area that I don't think anybody has talked about for distance, um, but there was an area of what may or may not be retrosplenial cortex. If this area looks familiar to you and you know something about it, reach out to me and help me understand what it is and what it's doing. But um, it showed this really interesting response where it showed an incredibly ro ro robust response that was far greater when participants were looking at objects in near space compared to far space. So this is the univariate analyses and these um, were, were very consistent with what we might expect from the past literature. But then we did multivariate analyses um, where we used representational similarity analysis in order to look at the activation patterns. And in that situation, we saw very different results. We had all sorts of different models for size and distance and retinal angle. And just as the real estate agents always say, location, 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 what the brain said in these analysis uh, was, uh, in this analysis was distance, distance, distance. So in every area that we looked at, the model that really trumped all the others in terms of explaining the pattern of activation was a model that said um, that distance was important, that near objects were similar to other near objects, regardless of the other properties. Um, uh, and that was completely ubiquitous through all these, these visual areas. Um, and so that was really the new finding in some of these things is that physical distance um, seems to be um, a very potent signal throughout the visual system. Um, and, you know, we can't help but think that part of that is because uh, near objects are very um, relevant to our behaviors in the real world and, and evolutionarily very important because, of course, we can only interact directly with objects that are in our near space. Um, we also, you know, I'm thinking about some of this, even in the ventral stream, so we saw that distance was important even in areas like LO, um, and we think that, that maybe it might be that distance uh, may be important because distance, of course, allows us to infer physical size. Um, and physical size might be an important property in recognizing objects that warrants a bit more consideration. So if you think of a task like going to the supermarket and trying to pick some citrus, um, if you've got a bunch of objects like citrus fruits that have similar shapes and similar textures, one of the most crucial cues for dis distinguishing between them is their physical size. But of course, to infer their physical size, if you've only got retinal angle, um, it's also helpful to know the distance. So the conclusions from this uh, part of my talk suggest that there's growing evidence that realness uh, matters in cognitive neuroscience. So I've summarized some research that suggests that real objects are processed differently than artificial, or sorry, real actions are processed differently than artificial actions, uh, that real objects seem to be processed differently than images, uh, behaviorally and neurally that those differences in many cases are qualitative, but can also be quantitative, particularly when we look at the neural representations. 
And I hope I've shown you that there are some features of real objects that are absent in images, but that might be important. And so we've looked at distance as one of those. Um, but one of the other questions that, that we're really interested in is what other aspects of real objects might be neglected in modern day vision science and computer science, um, because both um, you know, fMRI research and a lot of the computer science work in artificial neural networks just um, relies on uh, two-dimensional images that don't convey features like size and distance. And so uh, we think with the, the ability now to, um, to actually study real objects, we might, um, uh, we might be able to discover some interesting new properties that are relevant. Okay, so I've got uh, about 10 minutes left and I'd like to just um, uh, zoom out a little bit here and just talk about some of the broader things that uh, we've been thinking about in my lab. Um, about some of the things for this idea of immersive neuroscience of, of how we can continue to push things closer to the real world. Um, and one way we've been thinking about it was summarized here in this um, uh, recent picture from uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences paper from uh, Jackie Snow and I, um, where we were conceptualizing, uh, this is focused mostly on, on vision science, but the way that we've um, addressed our understanding of vision, um, which has been a very sensible way to do things, especially in the early days of vision science, um, when we were trying to understand um, early visual areas and early visual processes, um, the approach that was taken was largely based on, on using quite reductionist stimuli that could isolate specific attributes, things like spatial frequency or uh, motion or stereo. Um, and the idea was that we could kind of start with these simple stimuli and we could start with uh, the earliest levels of visual processing um, uh, leading up to say V1 and uh, do this mapping between these, these uh, simplified stimuli and the neural responses. And, and we kind of over the, the years moved uh, to more complicated stimuli like um, uh, photorealistic images and even movies. Um, but a lot of the work in vision science has really been focused on this quadrant here where we have um, outstanding experimental control and convenience, but limited ecological validity. Um, if we take this all the way to the extreme, we can get to real tangible stimuli, um, uh, as we've, we've done in some of the experiments that I told you about. Um, and more recently, now that we have um, uh, affordable consumer grade um, virtual and augmented reality, and as those technologies are improving, we can also begin to fill the gap here between uh, some of these simplified stimuli and the real world. And so one of the big questions we're interested in is that, that sort of uh, that we've attempted to convey here with these dashed lines here is one of the interesting questions is, is this a continuum? Are these things, um, is it the case that virtual reality gives you responses that are very much like real stimuli? Or is there some kind of a crucial difference that happens here as you go from the real to the virtual? And there's not necessarily one single answer here. This might depend upon um, which aspects of, of cognition and brain processing we're focusing on. So we've seen one case that I showed you today, which was um, size and distance perception, where, where it does seem like the virtual may not be a fully adequate proxy for, for what happens with real stimuli. But we think that it would be interesting to spend a bit more time working in this range of the um, spectrum. And we've also proposed that as an alternative to this kind of build-up approach that the field has taken historically, there's also another alternative, which is what we call the teardown approach, where we can begin with reality and we can strip certain things away. So we can do things like what I showed you, comparing VR to reality and then looking at the differences to see whether things matter. And so I wanna be clear, we're not saying um, that there's, um, uh, the, the, there's any problems with working in this end of the spectrum. We're simply saying that the field right now is mostly here and there's an opportunity um, to move out and um, uh, explore a greater range of that spectrum. Uh, we've also become very interested in, in looking at other techniques and it feels like um, there, there's a lot of interesting new techniques that are coming out that might be more reality friendly. 
than, um, than the predominant techniques these days like fMRI. And so my lab has moved a little bit more into uh, FNIRS research and um, our uh, university has just gotten access to one version of FNIRS, this kernel flow 50, which is a higher resolution version than conventional FNIRS um, that can begin to get resolutions that are more comparable to fMRI and, and a little more um, exciting for those of us who are look, interested in looking at brain areas and not just um, brain lobes and so on. Um, there's other techniques, of course, like EEG. There's some exciting technologies coming out, um, things like portable MEG from uh, the UCL group and so on that uh, may be moving towards a situation where we can measure the brain under more natural uh, circumstances. So these techniques are certainly exciting. The other thing that's exciting um, technologically is that there's um, all these opportunities with better virtual reality systems, with the opportunity to make um, extremely compelling simulations through things like video games. Um, and so even though we'd like to treat reality as the gold standard, um, there are many situations where these simulations have benefits, including that in simulations, you can have better control, better storage of important variables, and you can even do experimental manipulations that aren't possible in reality. So for example, we're doing a study in virtual reality looking at how gravity is perceived by manipulating gravity, which of course is not possible to do in the real world. Um, and so we started thinking about some of these things like this, that we can begin to compare reality to some of the proxies, as we can think, for example, of size perception in VR versus reality. We can see whether there's a difference. If there is, we can begin to determine the source of the difference. So in the example I gave you, it seems to be the vergence accommodation conflict which then can give us some technological solutions. So maybe if the industry can move towards things like light field technology, then that will yield more veridical perception. And it can also lead to theoretical uh, things of learning, well, what seems to be important here, that the um, accommodation uh, does seem to, or at least its conflict with vergence does seem to be important in changing how we perceive the sizes of things. And, and hopefully all of this will ultimately lead to more real world applications. Um, there's different views out there in the field about um, whether virtual reality should be um, uh, a good proxy for reality. So on one side, um, Nico Troy has written a provocative piece in Perception um, where he argues that there's a lot of benefits to virtual reality, that it's ecocentric, it's immersive, it induces this sense of presence. And in his view, that those things might be particularly important for recruiting dorsal stream processes and experiments. Um, alternatively, we have um, uh, another view from this team here that suggests that there are, are severe limitations to virtual reality um, because you don't have these closed loops, you don't have the haptic feedback, and that means that you end up doing things more in a pantomime mode, which recruits the ventral stream more than the dorsal stream. And then we have discussions, I get into this discussion regularly with my colleague Mel Goodale, where he says, but surely if you had perfect virtual reality, you and your brain couldn't tell the difference. Um, if, uh, if you got the virtual reality just right, and that would be true to a point, but the reason I have this image of this kid with the hamburger is that as soon as you tried to perform an action, no matter how realistic this hamburger looks, as soon as you tried to eat it, it would fail to meet your goals. And, um, and again, I think we have to think about the closed loop that it's not just the perception, it's about what you can do with the objects. And so it might matter whether or not you actually perceive the hamburger as real and able to uh, satiate your hunger or not. Um, coming back to this slide where I was mentioning uh, the difference between open and closed loop experiments, we've begun to thought of, think about how we can uh, begin to explore whether or not closed loop functioning is important um, uh, for the brain. And so one of the things that we're doing is um, having participants play video games in the scanner. And we started with Pac-Man. Now, Pac-Man is not at all real world. Uh, nobody's getting chased by ghosts to eat power pellets. Um, but what does make this, um, uh, or does make one aspect of this um, 
realistic is that it's a closed loop task that you are constantly updating your goals based on the consequences of your actions and based on how the environment changes. So whether or not you've just eaten a power pellet, how close the ghosts are and so on. And so we're starting some experiments where we have people playing Pac-Man uh, where they're in control of the game, or they do a case of what we call reactive replay. So they watch somebody else playing the game, but they move the, the joystick in response to what happens. So they've got the same perceptions and they've got the same actions, but it's reactive rather than proactive. And then comparing that to passive viewing, which is more like what a lot of cognitive neuroscience studies do of, of showing videos and having um, observation of things and so on. So we're looking at brain responses and brain connectivity in these three cases to see if we can um, get any traction on understanding um, you know, how the brain might function differently in a closed loop system compared to an open loop system. And we're also through working with my colleague, Jorn Dietrichsen, uh, working on different ways to begin to analyze experiments uh, for what Eleanor McGuire called the freely behaving brain and what, what she and her colleagues did some really elegant work on of, um, instead of experimenters constraining what the participant does, you just let the participant play the game, and then you use your you, you use more sophisticated approaches in your analyses to begin to um, uh, relate events in the game to events in the brain. Um, so with that, hopefully um, I've given you a sense of um, this idea that we're talking about called immersive neuroscience and how we might begin to think about how we could move cognitive neuroscience closer to the real world. Um, I'd like to end by thanking uh, my lab shown here in the pictures and by thanking the funding agencies that have made this work possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jody, for a wonderful talk. And um, I would like to ask everybody to unmute yourself so we can give uh, Jody a big applaud um, for a great talk. And um, and I would like to uh, so I would like to open the stage for questions. But um, so I have the privilege of asking the first one. <laughs> I don't usually do that, but I will. Uh, I want to ask regarding the um, VR, which you said there is this um, conflict of not being precisely or not mimicking real world um, processes uh, from your findings. And I want to ask if you think that this has to do with the fact that the stimuli that you've been using, and I don't know about others, um, is more uh, object oriented and does not is not about the surroundings. So I'm wondering whether if you think that if you would have looked at the actual environment and not the actual object within it, which more or less require more fovea or central processing, where maybe, maybe the, the, the reality is more about the surrounding and less about the objects within it. I, I, it just Excellent question and a completely valid point. So yes, our objects were shown in isolation um, and, and we expect that, you know, if you'd shown it in a richer context with, um, uh, with other things in the environment, then, then you get a lot of relative size cues um, from familiar things. So, uh, and that's actually one of the follow-up projects we'd love to do would be then to, to take um, some of our existing data or our existing paradigm and, and put other objects in the scene. And that was actually part of why we wanted to, um, to move to virtual reality was because we thought, well, if we get into VR, it's a lot easier to manipulate scenes. Um, but then when we couldn't get the exact same behaviors in VR, um, the, then, then we began to question it. But I think there's definitely some interesting things there of looking at um, how context might shape it. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's an important caveat that by looking at just an object in isolation, it was, um, it was limited, but nevertheless, it shows that, that there are some, um, uh, some things that didn't work how we would have expected them to going into the experiment and, and that, um, that, that there may be some question of how veridically VR um, can, can trigger the same responses. Yeah, lo lovely. Okay. I, I, by the way, I don't see it as a caveat at all. I see it as informative. Um, knowing, um, anyway, um, it's interesting and fascinating uh, and characterizing the system better. But okay, that was my question. I have a few more, but I'll, I'll let the other. <laughs> Great, you thanks. Know? Thank you. Uh, do you want to moderate questions or do you want me to just go? I see a bunch of hands up here, starting with Jeremy. 
go ahead, whoever. Okay. Yeah, just as long as people. So maybe Jeremy and then uh, Jan and Oliver. Good morning, Jody. Hi, Jeremy. Um, so my, my, my question is actually a, a follow up on uh, on Sharon's question, which is uh, that having to do with with the isolated objects. What I'm wondering is if you've got um, multiple objects in the field or mul or multiple objects in a scene, do the reality based responses depend on whether you're paying attention to the object. So it, it, it is, is, is the, is the real, uh, the realness, a, a, a pre-attentive or a, a uh, or, or property or one that requires attention? Oh, that's I can't quite question. figure out how you do the experiment easily, but, but that's, that's your problem. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. Um, we haven't, we haven't done anything like that yet. I mean, I did mention that the, the this uh, real object advantage does seem to involve an attentional component that, that the real objects are more engaging. Um, uh, there might be ways. Um, I, I don't do much with um, EEG or ERP, but I'm thinking there might be ways uh, for people who do know that that kind of literature better. And there's been certainly some uh, some nice work from um, Juan Chen looking at size perception with EEG and finding differences between um, early visual responses mm -hmm. and later ones. Um, and so I would love uh, if there was, was someone that did know those uh, ERP things uh, to maybe compare some ERP responses um, to real objects and images and see, um, uh, see, see if that might be a way to get it at some of the questions. Um, of course, the other option being behavioral studies. Uh, the big problem is reality is a pain in the butt. So those kind of experiments are are hard to do, which is part of why um, why we were hoping that that um, that VR would be a good proxy. Um, so you know the other option would be to do some of these in in VR or to to try to to do some crazy experiment in reality with multiple objects. It's it's the portable uh, MR scanner that you really need. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping in some ways that to some degree, some of these FNIRS things might, might be a poor man's version of that, that at least you can't get deep into the brain, but you can get the outer cortex. Uh, Jan and Oliver. Hi, Jody, great talk. Um, it's clearly disappointing that virtual reality isn't quite real enough, but I wonder if this is to be handled by taking a, a third dimension of your, of your plot, which is to, um, participant variables. So for instance, I imagine most of your participants are kind of uh, willing young students and graduate students who have plenty of accommodation. Mm -hmm. But if you wheeled in your emeritus colleagues who <laughs> haven't been able to accommodate for the past 20 years, <laughs> do you think you might get a, a more satisfactory effect of virtual reality? I think so, yeah. We've talked about that experiment for sure as, as someone who's in that uh, <laughs> more presbyopic um, demographic. Uh, I've certainly had that. And you're, you're exactly right. These were all done on um, you know, 20 year old uh, university students. Um, so we've been playing with some of that and we have been doing some, we've got a follow-up experiment. And I see Laurie's on the call here. We're doing some follow-up things to look at um, different aspects of accommodation. But yeah, I would love to look at some of this in um, presbyopic people. And maybe also we know from, um, uh, you know, from amblyopia, but also some of the work of people like Robert Hess, that people differ a lot in how valuable um, binocular cues are. Yeah, I mean, AC over A ratios are quite variable, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love to look at some of the individual differences there and and see. You're right. It might not matter um, to to the professors emerita emerita. Okay, you need um, to get Mel back in the magnet. <laughs> All right. I'll tell them that. <laughs> Uh, Asaf. Yes, hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. Uh, maybe continuing this line about individual differences, um, one of the factors that have been suggested to kind of modulate this transition between the ventral representations and the dorsal representations is experience, and especially, you know, in tool manipulation. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts or if you've explored this question of how experience would modulate, you know, the, the phenomena that you're reporting here. Oh, that's interesting. 
Uh, it's certainly something that comes up in our discussions a lot with things like virtual reality and with the, the video games and so on. Um, and so, you know, I wonder, coming back to the individual differences question, if we were to test participants who had a lot of experience in 3D gaming and so on, if maybe they've learned to um, rebalance the, the weighting of cues um, uh, based on the, the amount of time they've spent in VR. Um, yeah, in a way you could think about experience, right, as, as kind of bridging the gap between those same, you know, representations and the actual object. So it would be interesting to see how, you know, experience in that respect would, would uh, kind of modulate this effect. Yeah, great suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, see lots of old friends here. It's nice to, uh, to see lots of people that I haven't seen in a couple of years or more. Um, Jody, I'm, I'm following up on my second question. I said I have a few, but anyway, sure. so <laughs> second round. Um, I wanted to ask the distance effect that you have found in the um, um, uh, multivoxel pattern analysis. Uh, do you think, uh, so I, what I want to ask is if you think it's just an amplif uh, amplification of the distance that is uh, being uh, classified more successfully than the other. Uh, so is it a thresh, like, a threshold effect or is it really some tuning towards distance relative to the other um to the other um um car uh, let's say dimensions that you were testing or i don't know i will say it's really powerful that this is uh, for, for those of you who worked with multivoxel pattern analysis and representational similarity analysis there's a lot of data sets we have where you kind of try to read the tea leaves and you know, like, okay, I can sort of see that. And then you run it through your models and it's statistically significant. This was some of the most robust data I've ever seen, the kind where you don't need, I should have actually put some of the, the, the similarity matrices, like you don't need any kind of statistics to see how, how swamping distance is. And it does relate, there's, we've seen hints of this in some of our past studies, uh, even one this, this very simple experiment we did many years ago with uh, my first PhD student, Derek Quinlan, which was just based about vergence distance. So it was the simplest experiment I've ever done in the scanner. You have a participant in the scanner and they're fixating on an LED and that LED is at different distances. And you get these massive um, changes in brain responses throughout the visual system where the nearer they're verging, the higher the response. Uh, and that was true, especially in this Spock area, but even in early visual cortex and so on. So I've just been really gobsmacked by how potent these responses are. Um, I'm not sure, I probably didn't actually answer your question there, but. Okay, um, but it's good enough. <laughs> Thank you. But I, don't, I don't know if you want to follow up. Um, yeah, maybe, I mean, if I have more, I'll, I'll email you about this, but thank you. Gali? I see. I, Elite. Yeah. Hi. Um, great hi. talk, Judith. It was very interesting. Um, I, I was wondering what do you think about the fact that uh, for many years, you know, we were so obsessed in anal about, you know, exposure durations and chin rests and, you know, all those well-controlled experiments that, and we now give it up and we see that nothing, you know, things, we can really get valid data and, and, um, so are you bothered by the fact that we give up all those different factors that we are so obsessed about in the fact and thought that our experiments wouldn't be good enough if we wouldn't control them? And now we were, I mean, I also see it in my experiments, right? You know, we move to online experiments um, and, 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 you know, we, we find valid data. We replicate our previous findings. I mean, do you think, do you have any thoughts about it that should you worry about something that we... Well, I think we, we have to worry in the sense that you just said that I think we need to validate um, validate it against the more controlled things um, to, to see whether it makes a difference or not. Um, I mean, the yeah. one that we're, we're really struggling with these days um, that, that's another kind of elephant in the room we never talk about is how everybody fixates in all of our experiments. And so we're trying to look, especially um, now there's a, a cool new algorithm where you can track the eyes just with the eyeballs in the MRI scan. So I'm trying to get our hands on that algorithm. So then we don't have to set up pain in the butt eye trackers in the scanner. Right. Um, yeah, but, it's a fixation you know, process, right? I mean, right. Mm -hmm. But I think we need those experiments to see whether those things matter or not. Um, it certainly, you know, they can add complexity and, and with things like eye tracking, 
um, you know, it makes it really hard in areas like the dorsal stream. Um, in the ventral stream, it probably doesn't matter so much whether you fixate or not, but in the dorsal stream, you're going to add a whole lot of noise to your activation based on um, gaze shifts and vergent shifts and all of that. So, um, you know, it's one of the tensions, even though I'm, I'm advocating to move things closer to the real world, I, I think we need to do so somewhat carefully that, um, you know, looking at what matters and what doesn't and, and where can we release our control and where might it just lead to complete chaos in trying to understand things. Mm -hmm. Right. But in your experiments, actually, there is no chaos, I think. Um, I mean, I think we, in many cases, um, we do replicate previous findings. I mean, this, this is my experience. Um, yeah. But so, and some of it is limitations of our techniques as well. Like you think about something like you mentioned the chin rest, which we can get rid of in behavioral experiments, but you can't, um, let people squirm around in the scanner, you get garbage data. So that's where, you know, we may need to hope that some of these should do some things, um, you know, like we really want to study motion parallax, but we can't do that with fMRI in too meaningful a way because you can't do this in the scanner. Uh, other questions? Um, I'll ask just another one sure. uh, about the scanner and the experiment in the scanner when you had this uh, device, the rotating device with the mm -hmm. socks and the hammers and everything, um, they were all manipul manipulable objects, but I'm wondering if you would just put, let's say, um, some kind of a toy uh, or a sketch version of a room scene, you know, miniature room scene or some layout of uh, um, things that we don't usually touch that are, um, do you think then uh, there will also be, uh, you, would you think then also different areas would show the same separation between the preference for, let's say, uh, real world versus um, uh, 2D? Or do you think, I mean, do you think that there's an interaction between the types of, um, stimuli you used and what we do in them or with them and the findings or do you think it's an overall effect great question uh there's an experiment we've been talking about for years that we call the cactus experiment but we've never done of you know looking at something like imagine a round cactus with spikes versus a tennis ball or something something you might want to grasp and something you might not um and we've never done that that particular study but I think it raises interesting questions about you know, what, what matters with uh, the real objects and that issue of actability. We did in the, the ham, what we call the hammer sock experiment um, in our lab, uh, uh, we did deliberately have tools and non-tools. Um, and there was some interesting breakdown there, but it didn't fall in terms of tools versus non-tools. And we're still trying to make sense of what what attributes really matter there. It was hard with because we only had six objects to really tell, but it would be great to, to test a more diverse range of stimuli and see um, to look at some of those questions like you're asking. And we're also, we're starting a whole other line of experiments where we've got a 3D projector in the scanner and we're making um, real, well, we're making 3D faces and 3D scenes and all the geometry is as good as you can get it to be to match the real world. Um, so we're starting to look at some of that. And again, we're sort of hoping if, if we can get interesting stuff with the simulations, we might be able to do more experiments because, you know, as much as it was fun to use that droid, it was a real pain. And I can't find any grad students with enough grit to be willing to do these crazy experiments um, with this crazy equipment because it's, um, yeah, it, it takes a bit of a commitment to, uh, to get some of these things going. So I don't know, we might be able to look at some of it with virtual, but again, I think we need to validate the virtual against the real. So um, we'll, we'll see what happens, but yeah, great idea for an experiment. Yeah, I'll write you a bit more about them. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, okay, so again, I'd like to thank you a lot for joining us uh, for a wonderful talk. And um, again, many thanks for joining us. Um, Jody and everybody and um, next week um, we'll be here on the same time and I don't have the calendar with me which is uh...
a shame, but uh, I will uh, send an email with, with all the um, details about next week's talks. And again, thank you so much, Jody. And um, I hope to see you with us um, throughout this seminar series, but it's optional. Great, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for, for coming. Uh, it was really nice to see all your faces here. Bye. Bye Jody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Sharon. Bye.